How's everybody doing out there? Thank you for joining us for the first episode, Long Awaited Prop Ops. I'm Lincoln Ogata, and I'm going to take you through my background this episode and my co-host, Corey James, here, and kind of tell you a little about who we are and what we want this channel to do. So, again, my name is Lincoln Ogata. I've been in student housing for the last 12 years. I have worked for a variety of companies. I have worked at a variety of sites. I've been at sites as small as 400 beds up to a P3 project with just under 7,000 beds. I've seen a little bit of everything. Uh, before that, I was in the military in a group called the Seabees, a uh, construction battalion unit, and uh, it was a civil engineer corps. So my background is in construction, and I took that, and when I got out, found myself, as many of you all did, in student housing or in housing in some capacity. And here I am 12 years later. So that's my background. I also have with me today, Corey James, who's also been in this for a long time, and I'll let Corey explain it to you. I started on the managerial side, I guess. I started like a lot of you as a CA at a, just a small mom and pop property uh, here in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, worked up to be the general manager there, um, then moved over to one of the larger student housing companies as a leasing agent. Um, worked up through the years to become the manager there. Um, and then I joined Lincoln over at that P3 project where him and I kind of oversaw the inaugural uh, turn slash conference schedule um, for 7,000 beds, um, approximately 40 to 50 conferences, um, all turned in and out over a three month period, all doing it like folks used to do. Some of you may still do it now where we had an Excel sheet that was the size of a wall that we were working off of, um, which seems archaic in 2021. But after that, I did go back into management a little bit more and am now working here with with Lincoln on, on trying to, to take this this system, this turn system and, and make it bring it into the uh, the times that are now. So absolutely. So yeah, as he said, uh, we, we do work for a company called Easy Turn. And uh, our main focus is the operational and software approach to making turn a smoother process. You know, kind of the point of this channel though in general though is just kind of the ca casual conversation. Uh, just an ability to, to really talk and be honest. And we want to hear from you all as well. Have you all submit some questions, but just really talk about what it's like to be in a student housing machine. Uh, all of you out there who are in this, and again, even if you're multifamily, uh, it's still very similar. There's no heroes in, in, in modern day that, that happen to be property managers, uh, at least on the big screen. But as we know, it's an insane job. Uh, I often tell people logistically, it's an impossible thing that we do every year, especially in the student housing side. It doesn't make any sense that you could take a uh, thousand beds, 600 beds. And in a 14 day period, sometimes eight, nine day period, we're going through painters, cleaners, carpet cleaners, something that would take an individual house uh, a week or so to plan out a week and a half or so to knock out for one location. And we're not talking about small ones. Some of these units are the exact same size as some of the homes that you all live in. So when you explain to a non-student housing person, what we do, we work miracles. Um, we have an awesome team. Uh, and that's really kind of the importance. And that's kind of the cool dynamic between Corey and myself. My background is in uh, the facility side and he comes from the operational side. As you know, when you get higher up, you do operational on both ends, but really with the two perspectives and kind of with this uh, marriage, if you will, uh, between the property side and the facility side, it's the only way you're going to have a really good turn. And it's also why I have my Mr. Miyagi shirt on today, the original maintenance man. So I'm giving a shout out to Mr. Miyagi uh, for being the OG of the maintenance world. So. Corey, we went over the, the point of this channel and really what we want to get back from you all. And that is we have our experience, as you all heard, we work together. But kind of the whole point of this thing is we want to hear what it's like elsewhere. Right. So we've worked primarily on the East Coast, um, even though I've had some dealings with, with other properties. And obviously through Easy Turn, I feel like I've turned the entire United States of America at this point. But we really want to hear some things. Um, we're going to have some similar points of views being at the same property for a certain amount of time. Uh, but we really do want to hear back from you all. We, you know, we love all the tips, tricks. I think if we all worked in this together for so long, it was so isolated uh, between what we have and, and what we know uh, in this system. But everyone has little tricks and I love learning them. Working with Easy Turn, I talked to, again, GMs from all over the country and I learned something all the time. So I used to joke that I was the turn expert. If I wasn't one then, after hearing all this now, I got to be closer to that. Uh, so Corey, um, you know, just kind of as we just got done with our season, as you all know, of turn, just kind of speak, if you will, on your experience through this first turn working with us at Easy Turn. Um, it was one of those things where when I first first started looking at Easy Turn and looking at the software, 
it's almost like a piece of a puzzle that's been missing forever that fits right in there perfectly. You know, we look at housing in general, everything is automated, your leasing software, your marketing software, your work order software, yet turn, we're still writing on, you know, Excel spreadsheets, ripping them in half, giving them multiple, multiple painters, hoping they do the right units on their sheets, not knowing if they're done until they come back at the end of the day. So you're, you know, kind of locked in the office. Um, if you want to communicate with them, you have to hope their crew managers on site. Um, you have to hope that, you know, he's got his phone and you're texting him and he's answering and he's not getting confused. And it, it just seems that, you know, this turn animal is one of the most important parts of housing because, you know, it can set the precedent and it can set the, the uh, mindset of your residents for the whole year. If they come into a dirty unit or if they come into a unit that's not turned, their eyes are going to be on everything for the rest of the year. So it's, you know, it's not just important from an operation standpoint, but it's important from a leasing standpoint as well. And having looked at what we've been able to do with Easy Turn as far as not just streamlining the, the process, but um, adding accountability to it and, you know, connecting all of the different crews and, and facets of turn into one location to where you can work from your desk or you can work from your phone and you can see where everybody is at that exact moment, know your progress, know if you're falling behind, know to be able to tell your crews, hey, you guys have a big schedule coming up the next couple of days. Right now you're running a little bit behind. You need to add some folks. Um, it, it's just one of those things that when I first saw it, it was almost like common sense. Why hasn't this been here? And, and so for this last turn to be able to to sit there and watch, you know, thousands and thousands of beds being turned. And I can, from my basement in Lexington, Kentucky, tell you exactly where painters are in Athens, Georgia, or Tuscaloosa. Um, it's, it's, it's really incredible. And, and that's, I think it's a tool that once you decide you want to use it, once you use it that first turn, you're going to wonder why you, you hadn't had it before. And, and just to piggyback on that too, just to, to, the kind, the kind of issue that we have. I, I was at a position once where I was able to go out and find a software that would help with the term process. And there was just nothing built for it. Everything was either multifamily focused or, you know, construction management focused. So this wasn't here. So uh, for those that are customers of ours uh, watching right now, I say this all the time, but we really were built out of frustration. Everything that we couldn't find uh, out there in the market of software, that's what we really wanted to put into this. So this is really meticulously built by anything that I would come across, any report I used to have to run for my regionals, any anything that I ever had to put together or do, we wanted to make sure that it was a really easy solution uh, for the student housing side. You know, this year we tackled uh, about, about just uh, maybe a bit more, but around 65,000 beds this year. And as Corey said, just to be able to manage that and to see that from a distance, that, that's an advantage to your VPs, to your regionals. And then of course, obviously still it's useful to the site, site level and even down to your vendor who has a better way of tracking. They didn't like getting pieces of handwritten note either out there in the field. They didn't like tearing their list in half and handing it off to somebody else. Um, so this always seemed like a common sense thing and uh, you know, that this was a next step. And again, when you have, you know, 30 different things out there and not picking on, but 30 different things out there that do um, roommate matching or, or package delivery. And there was nothing out there specifically built for turn, which again, as you all know, is the most crucial, of course, I say this from the facility side, the most crucial time of the year. Leasing is important too, but leasing is really, really tough if you have terrible reviews because your last turn was horrible and people got put up in hotels, right? So again, we just kind of want to talk about, you know, how this turn wins whole for us though. Well, again, we were all over the country. We were coast to coast this year. Um, you know, pandemic came, uh, did its thing. And uh, really, it kind of magnified the need for us. People didn't, couldn't travel as much, right? So now, if, if Corey's my, my GM and I'm a regional, I can hop on and see exactly what's going on in his property as he described before. So we obviously know that we're at the front end of this wave that's going to be uh, easy turn or, you know, uh, just software in this space, period, right? So uh, we're really excited about the product we put together. We've been around. This was our fourth turn, and we have a very active development team that we are just, we've got, we've got a big long list for them to get things done. We're growing, we're getting better, we're getting sharper. Uh, we're really excited about that portion of it. But yeah, that's how our turn went this last time around. For those of you that used us again, uh, you know, we know that, that you all got to see the benefit. We also like to think of ourselves as a software, um, like a summer turn specialist, right? I won't say an AGM, like a, like a software AGM, but we really are an extra helper there as far as the software goes over the summer. It's extra accountability when you have a maybe very forward demanding vendor who's coming to you telling you that, you know, you owe for certain rooms or something. 
Um, and maybe in the thick of turn, you can't even go back and prove him right or wrong, him or her right or wrong. Um, with this software, they're only getting work that you schedule and only once you approve it, can they bill. So that's one of our big things. I think that's a really, really big step. I think it really empowers GMs on the site uh, to be able to be more confident whenever they get these invoices in and say, okay, we assigned these to him. We assigned these to this team and we approved it. So they're okay with that process. So um, let's jump in from off camera. I got a question for both of you guys that you could possibly answer. It's, it's going into turning what you've seen from your expectations. Is it the same as far as like the data that you see from easy turn to what uh, you thought going into the process? Are you seeing what you expected uh, when you look back on analytics and things of that nature, working with these different properties? Well, I'll say uh, that's a great point, Chase. We get a lot of high end analytics here. We get to keep stats that no one ever kept before actual percents of go backs from vendors or whatnot. I used to always have the line and I said, just because they're a really, really nice vendor doesn't mean that they're your best vendor, right? So sometimes the smoothest talkers are your worst vendors. So I think kind of to his point, something that our system can really show you is when you think, um, maybe you think all three of your cleaning vendors are virtually the same and you go back and you're looking and you see that, you know, vendor A is taking twice as long as B and C and they have the most go backs or maybe one that you didn't think of as being that great was actually super efficient and knocking it out. One thing that we have seen is there, it, there seems to be a line of overworking your staff, meaning maybe up to, at this site, maybe up to 20 units a day, they have a very low go back rate. Maybe there's some fatigue factor that comes in there and everything from, you know, unit 20 to 30, they've got a 50% go back factor. So what does that mean? That doesn't mean um, we're just going to get less done each day. It might mean, you, might mean you need to bring in another team to get the quality work, um, or maybe they need some extra staffing. But again, these are all things that um, we could maybe assume before, but now we actually have the hard analytics to go. Do you have anything else to that? Yeah, he did not answer the question. Um, yeah. So the the data that we can pull, and like you said, we can pull from 65,000 60, plus beds of return this year is, is kind of what you would expect in that the paint and the cleans showed the most go backs um, anywhere from, I, I think we're looking anywhere from 35 to 40%. And what you see too is uh, the number of go backs for each vendor really happens in their first day or two. And that's not necessarily to say that they're doing the most amount of units that day. They may be spread evenly across depending on, you know, how you want to schedule it, but it almost lends itself to maybe there wasn't, maybe they weren't trained in the GM's expectations of what we're looking for on these walkthroughs. And, you know, you can kind of see, you know, we've got, we've got properties where they, they did say, Hey, we're going to schedule 20 a day across four days. Well, you do see that number dwindle over those four days. And, you know, it, in talking with some of those GMs, it is, you know, finally I had to take my painter back in there and show them what we're looking for and show them, you know, this is what's consistently being missed. And that, you know, that, that you know, may lend itself to in the future. We, you know, when we talk to those GMs about the upcoming turn and things to work on this summer, maybe, you know, maybe paint a test unit or clean a test unit so you guys can get the, the expectations set forth before turn. And you're not seeing all these go backs and all these wasted time that first day or two, because you've done this before, you know what you're doing, you know what they're looking for. Um, carpet clean, you know, is always the one that's, you know, if there's carpet clean, it's not usually because the carpet clean is bad. It's either they maybe use dirty water or they maybe missed a closet or two, but the, you know, they were well under 10% go backs across the country. It was mainly the, you know, the, the two initial vendors that you did see the, the majority of the go backs on, which is to, to be expected, I would say. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it kind of lends itself out to, to you know, our, our software allows us to check patterns and, you know, to, to run data over thousands and thousands of beds to see what happened. And then, you know, once you have those numbers, you can kind of sit down and from our experience in the, in the uh, realm, be able to say, maybe this is what happened, or maybe this is what happened, or maybe this is how we figured it out. Um, and then we pitch it to the property, you know, some properties that had the lower go backs. Yeah, we've used those vendors a lot. They come in, we paint the model each year and, and, you know, we get those expectations there and others say, Hey, no, they, you know, we, we didn't really think about that. So, you know, it's just something to help another tool that software gives us to help prepare for upcoming terms, not just the one we're in. Can you guys pinpoint like the biggest mistake that you would say from a GM's perspective? Like if you were, if a GM was watching right now and a CM was watching right now, what would you say is the nationally from your guys' point of view, biggest mistake 
I'll go on that one. Um, in, in my experience, is a little different. I worked with a company that was a full service turn. And what they did is they basically showed up at your property and they would handle paint, clean, carpet clean, everything for you. Um, the one thing that they did really well um, that I know in some other individual spaces we had issues was they didn't just train the vendors they were going to use. They were great at training the backup vendors. And not only do they train the backup vendors on their expectations, but they train the backup vendors on um, the software and the app. So if a painter or a cleaner does drop the ball and leave, that backup vendor was there the next morning. They didn't even have to meet with the GM. Their list was already on their phone. They could show up and, and just start working. I know that you know sometimes a vendor quits and you can get flustered and freak out. Um, and, and that's it really showed the importance of training everybody that could be used, not just everybody you plan on using. Um, and I think they did really a really great job with that. And I think it really helped them keep moving while, you know, while some places it, it put them in a standstill. And I won't say it's the biggest mistake to happen this year, but as you all know, this year was really hard to hold on to vendors. That's what I heard from GMs all across the country. This was just not a normal year. Vendors were jumping ship for a few dollars more a unit from stories I heard. Um, there were ones walking off site. Um, you know, and, and we always kind of have some of that, but this year absolutely heard more stories about that than any of my previous, um, years working with easy turn or being in turn in general. So, you know, kind of to what Corey was bringing up the idea of a backup vendor, such a big deal. Um, again, the company he's talking about, they require to have backup vendors. I know that we used to have to get, you know, three or so bids and we would always at least try to have two vendors. Um, but in reality, often, even if my first vendor would walk off, my backup vendor really didn't have the manpower to handle you know, the remainder of the work. So um, I know it's hard to even find one vendor nowadays, but it, at least having a structure where maybe you have to pay more, you have to ask for more money, but having that backup vendor is a really big deal just to be able to have that, that side of it be covered. Um, and Corey also teased earlier our, uh, our first kind of segment here on pop-ups, which is going to be turn tricks and tips. So um, as he brought up earlier, it's one of my things I always bring up, uh, you know, whenever I'm talking with properties or talking to new owners, uh, or new property managers, and that is the test unit. And I'm going to kind of explain this whole thing, right? So the test unit is going to be a vacant unit that you have. If you have one, if not, congratulations, you're killing it. But if you have one before the turn process kicks off, when you're actually taking those bids, whether it be January, February, March timeframe, go ahead and pick a unit and don't go pick your worst unit, right? You want something that represents, um, not that they can handle the worst unit, but you want something that really helps you understand the speed that it takes to go through that unit, um, seeing uh, what finished product each vendor is going to have uh, or give to you. And I'd say bring them in, even if you have to pay them for that one unit at that time, that's fine. This does a couple of things, right? This lets you kind of go through the operational operations of having your maintenance team go in there, the, that expectation of make ready, um, then having the painters come in and seeing the quality of work, checking on the way uh, paint matches, making sure there's no overspray on mini blinds, light switches, or heaven forbid, uh, sprinkler heads. So let them come in and do that. And then also obviously with your cleaners and your carpet cleaner. So pick a unit, have them come out, give a little mini run uh, of your turn. And again, this lets you know the expectation level, which you just discussed, but it also helps you or helps them, sorry, figure out, is this a job I can handle? Can I do this 20 times a day? Um, is this worth the money for me, right? They're gonna be thinking about these items as it goes through. So it is absolutely something I recommend out there. If at all possible, go ahead and do a practice run with your vendors. And you might leave that, that test run and say, I can't keep this painter. I can't keep this, but do it early enough where you know if you need to go looking for some more vendors. So again, this can give you peace of mind or it can make you, you know, realize you need to find a new vendor. But either way, that is the first turn tip or trick that we have. We're going to bring one of these to you each week, but that is the big one. And that is the test unit. Do you have any examples that happened to you before? With doing well, testing or having yeah, vendors? Test yeah. oh, I oh, I have vendors that walk off sites. I have people that come in and, and uh, all this paint that we ordered, we've got 250 gallons of paint and we go put it on the wall and it doesn't match. And all of a sudden a roll tight turned into a cut and roll for all of it, which completely blew our budget out. Um, so I've had situations like that for sure. And I'm sure Corey's got. Yeah. Mine was more too. of a, from a managerial side, mine was more of a, we had a, a new vendor come in and he, he did everything great. And we had our vendor meeting and he neglected to tell us that they did not pay overtime. So his guys were only going to work 40 hours a week. They were out of a city about an hour away from us. So travel time was included. So each day, by the time they got there, they only had six hours worth of, of time they could work. 
come the Friday before move in, they've hit their 40 hours at 11 a.m. I've got all four of my buildings, the hallways were carpeted, which is a terrible idea. They did not clean those. Uh, I had to call somebody in the morning after, as soon as I get somebody was the night of move in, which is a nightmare. Um, and uh, I heard about that a lot. So that was one of those things that, you know, it's not just bringing them in to test a unit and make sure they can do it, but it's covering all your bases. They need to know that, you know, the same as our customer service team here knows, turn is not nine to five. It is not Monday through Friday. It is all day, all night. And they need to be aware of that. And that's something you would go over when you're running this test unit that, hey, I know we're doing this at two o'clock on a Tuesday, but this could be 2 a.m. on a Saturday. Can you still handle it? So absolutely. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse in your gut. Uh, there's nothing worse at all because your job is dependent on how turn is done. Uh, your regionals are looking at you, your owners, if you're a third party, are looking at you. If not, your company's looking at you. Uh, and if you are, you know, top person on site and you have vendors walk off and you don't have a backup plan, uh, you're in trouble. And so the whole idea of a test unit is just really some good due diligence on the front end to try to at least find out or have a general idea if you think that vendor is going to follow through or not. I will also say a little note in there, and I won't make this a separate one on a different episode, but I will also say if your vendors are showing up late to meetings that you're setting for them, or they're taking two to three weeks to get a piece of paperwork back to you. If it's early enough in the process, I would take that in consideration and maybe pull a few more backups. Um, it's easy to say, don't always go off price. And everyone out there is dealing with different budgets or whatnot, but definitely be transparent to your regional and say, um, you know, I found this person, they're almost uncomfortably cheaper than the other ones. We're going to go with them for right now. Um, but I just want to let you know that here are some other pricing we might have to do if they don't if they don't end up, um, you know, being this this amazing cheap vendor, which is a, a rarity to say the least. So definitely always doing your homework with your vendors. And that's kind of, again, the whole core of the idea of a test unit. It's for yourself. It's for your maintenance crew and it's for your vendors. And it really, really does set the tone and, again, helps you plan accordingly for that year. So. Again, we're, we're really excited. We really hope you all uh, come and tune in us as often as you all can. We want to make uh, casual talking on here. We want, to, we want you all to know that we, we care about your feedback. Um, and so, again, that's the whole idea of this channel, just to go through all this. I guess the last thing to just kind of mention, um, as you all got done, another little, little kind of a bit of advice out there for you. If you had something that tripped you up in uh, your turn, whether you're a customer of ours or not, write it down. Write it down, make it somewhere you can access it. Because again, if it got you this year, there's a good chance it's going to get you next year. And this is kind of the first stage of what the off-season process is. Um, again, again, you have your new students move in, your new people move in. You've got that whole tidal wave of work orders, hopefully not too much, but it always seems to feel that way at least. Um, go ahead and get those things done and out of the way. And before you forget and get into your holiday season, we all know this whole season starts going really, really quickly. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's New Year's. Uh, and we're, you know, at January. So don't forget, if you still remember some things that got you or some mistakes you don't want to make, make sure to write it down. So you can look at those again when you start the process in January or February or whatever your company, I guess, would have you do. And send those to us. Um, one thing we do want with this channel is we want to be interactive with you. We don't want to act like we're the experts because there are many people that are much better at this probably than we are that have been out there for many years. And then there are new, are new GMs. You know, there's new GMs every day. And the only way that we all can get better is if we all share information. So on our, you know, on our prop ops page, um, you know, we're going to ask weekly for suggestions, questions, comments, and then on, you know, the next episode, we'll go over those, but um, anything that you think would be helpful, please send our way. And, and we're happy to, to share those. And, and, you know, you don't know who you're helping when you send it, but anytime we can maybe keep one angry parent out of our office on move-in day. Absolutely. Um, it's great. So, uh, so, so definitely be interactive with us. We want to be interactive with you and, and, you know, maybe try and get everyone to improve as a whole. Again, this is a gr group session so we can all, you know, nationwide just get better as a group. Again, there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of things out there to, uh, to teach us. A lot of us learn on our own, but a lot of us run into the exact same problems. That's probably one of the biggest takeaways from easy turn, at least talking to all these GMs. I'll start saying something and, you know, everyone understands exactly what we're talking about. The same main points, no matter where we're located, California, uh, New York, Florida, Texas, no matter where we're located, we run into the same issues. Uh, so absolutely, as Corey said, we want interaction. We want to hear your questions. 
give us feedback and we'll talk about them. And uh, yeah. We appreciate y'all coming here by. Now. I know these guys running short, man. Y'all boys, teach boys. But uh, what, are, what are some trends in the student housing space that you guys are seeing? I know you guys are kind of removed a little bit, but as far as in general with construction, amenities, um, is there anything in that space that you guys are seeing that are pretty cool, interesting thought processes to think of when uh, creating or building uh, student housing spaces? Well, I, I can I can talk on one that hit my mind right when you said that. Uh, I think the amenities have kind of taken a turn. It used to be the same check marks, obtaining beds, uh, pools, gym, all those types of things. But I do think some things are changing now. Um, there's some things that we used to do kind of more public that we do on our own now. I know a lot of them used to have big gaming centers and stuff that really, um, you know, don't hit everywhere. A lot of people are gaming at home, but I will say I've seen this new trend of co-work spacing um, that they have where they will let you come in there and, you know, you can go in there, set up your computer, kind of these, these flex rooms, if you will, coffee maker. We've always kind of had that, but it's always been like in front of the leasing agents or in front of the offices. So um, what I've seen now though, is a separate area for that that people can go in there and access and actually work from home. And obviously during COVID, this was a huge deal to be able to go and work somewhere outside of your unit. Um, but I do feel like that kind of flexible working environment has kind of been bigger, but I do feel like there's been less emphasis on some of the other generic check boxes. Cause if everybody has it, it's not so much an amenity anymore. And as we know, um, there are some rare occasions, but usually amenities is to sell, you know, parents and maybe to sell the students. But the reality is throughout the year, those are not getting used. Like you would imagine they would, uh, on moving. The one thing that I have seen that was to think that five years ago, this would be as important as it, as it is now is um, there's a much bigger emphasis on students looking when it comes to um, internet access, internet usage, Wi-Fi. You know, a lot of our classes are still um, NTI. A lot of them are still online. And, you know, there are some properties that are still, you know, they might have concrete walls and things like that. And the Wi-Fi just, just doesn't allow students to stream their classes the way they need to or game if they're going to be doing that. So I know that, um, you know, back in the day when I say back in the day, when I was starting, it was it was the big pool and it was the hot tub. And, you know, I still remember the first movie theater. And now it's now it's, you know, what what speed is our Wi-Fi? Where can I get it? Um, do I have a hard line connection that I could hook up to if for some reason the Wi-Fi is lagging? Um, so I have seen we have seen kind of an uptick in um, connectivity and just making sure that they're going to be able to access that throughout. I think one of the cool things that I would notice is that it almost doesn't like depend on like if you have like the sauna and the stuff. I think a lot of these generations, especially coming up, they're looking for like Instagrammable things. You know what I'm saying? Like it could even be like a, a wall that has like cool little pictures or something like that. So I think it almost makes it like able for the smaller companies to compete a little bit better with a boutique style thing that's very trendy and you know a lot of people want to take pictures there they want they feel like that's a cool place to live type situation like i almost feel like that has kind of replaced the amenity space i don't know do y'all guys thought, have a thought about it that? is in, in the last property that i was at was one of those boutique style properties um where you know there's more emphasis on um how you know the, the property was was very nice but there's a huge emphasis on how it looked online mm. what do our pictures look like you know we had to have a professional photographer at every single resident event um, and I, I really like that style. I will, I will say the one issue I think they had is they were really great with that direction, but the guy or girl or team that they had running it was running it from the corporate office. So they were really out of tune. You know, the corporate office was based in New York city. They're really out of tune of what's happening in Lexington, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they may see a national trend that says that, you know, everybody's X, Y, and Z, as far as they like this, they want to see this that may not be the same in these smaller towns, these smaller Southern towns. So I think that while that idea of a presence online makes sense, I think you really need to, to leave some of that to the GMs or some of that, at least take the GMs input because they are there on the ground in the city that they live in. They're going to know more about what's happening, you know, here in Lexington than you are in, you know, Manhattan. That's interesting. And did you also, did you guys see, I sent Lincoln this story, but, there was a story about a girl that was a CA getting actually killed mm -hmm. by a maintenance person on site. Uh, they found a body at a different property or something like that, but the maintenance person had like a, the full access key, the master key, and was able to like go into the person's apartment. And have you ever seen anything like that? That's the first time I heard anything. I've been in the student housing industry for five, six, seven years, whatever it is now. 
from obviously another's perspective, but I've never read or seen an article like that where it was um, uh, a situation in that space. Uh, but it's interesting to me because of hiring people and you got to make sure you ha- got to hire the right people uh, in that space. Um, and I have to hire across the country. So um, I was wondering, have you guys seen any dynamics with hiring people where you're like, this may be something that may not go well for us? Or have you seen anything to the extent of what I was just talking about with that, that situation? Well, to speak on that situation, I actually I was kind of shocked that it, it went national because I had heard things like that before. Um, I guess I don't know what the unique factor was in this one um, that kind of made it go. But I have heard of other incidences where uh, people have had, you know, violence or or drunken um, maintenance or staff in general make their way into apartments. So obviously uh, that probably sounds terrifying for people that have kids in areas. But really, it's just it, it, it has to go down to the vetting process. And vetting process honestly can only do so much too. A lot of it, I feel like, can be curbed if if people really bring up if they're noticing a, a something about an employee. I have actually had an employee before that uh, great interview came in, great references, great background, and I knew about a week or so into it there was just something a little off uh, about this individual. And I luckily at that time worked with a company that kind of let me use my intuition uh, to go ahead and and, and have him go. Um, so, you know, you can't always do that. And even if you do background checks, it, it, it sounds crazy. I mean, it sounds obvious, but obviously everyone has a first time for anything and you don't want that to be on your site. Right. So I, I think even if they pass the background check, you can say they passed the background check. Um, and obviously right now, as we're kind of desperate for workers, it makes it a harder and tougher line, uh, just to kind of speak to what's out there and available for it. Um, I know they're doing a lot of big things now with different key systems to try to help out with that some more. Um, obviously, someone who's planning on doing something that heinous uh, probably doesn't care if they have to fake or lie about something in order to get there. Um, but there are some things out there that do give a little better accountability for that. But I have heard of incidences of maintenance individuals, staff individuals going into apartments and using a master key, which is a cardinal sin. Um, and uh, so the only thing I really can say to that is even if you do your background checks and stuff, I would say just really kind of be involved and, and try to get to know your staff if you're a GM. Um, and really, uh, if you're a regional, you know, listen to your GMs. If you're a GM, listen to maybe some other people. If you have more than one person, especially bringing something up about somebody, you know, further investigate. And HR departments out there, uh, make sure you have something in place that give people an opportunity to, without putting their job on the line, really bring up if they have a, you know, a feeling about someone or something doesn't feel right. So it is a tragedy nonetheless. Um, but I do think it's something that can be a learning point for properties out there in the hiring process. Yeah, that's a, that's a nightmare, not just as a, as a GM, but as a parent to, to, to think that there are, you know, there, there is a certain amount of trust that you do have to put with your maintenance folks and, and just your staff in general, because we do have keys and we do have access and, 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 you know, the best, the best thing you can do too, you know, as far as not just the hiring process is documentation. Um, make sure that you've got a stringent key protection system. Make sure that, People are checking them in, checking them out. Make sure that you double check to make sure that the keys that are going in or out coincide with reasons we're going in these units. Make sure that somebody's not just writing a key down and that unit hasn't had a work order, hasn't had a request for us to come in in a while. There are some some features not just on there, but you know, with Easy Turn, we do have um, an action item system that you can actually assign these to people. You can see where they are, when they are checking in, checking out. You know, and it just provides an extra level of accountability. But you know, like Lincoln said, I don't think that. You know, when somebody has their mindset on that, they're going to do it regardless of, of, of what systems you have in place. So you just have to make sure that you do you can do your very best to protect not just the residents, but, you know, yourself and your business just through, you know, being stringent and, and, and double checking and triple checking. And, you know, I know that the trust but verify is a uh, is a big saying out there that I know a lot of you have had to, to listen to over and over. But it's the truth. It's, you know. We, we trust these folks to, to come in and do their job, but you have to verify that what they're doing is what they're supposed to be doing. And even as we're discussing this, I'm remembering a little bit more about the story, but I'm pretty sure they were in some sort of relationship or he had been coming on to her. Um, she was obviously a staff member as well. So again, this really has to do with having an open environment where you feel free to talk to your staff and your staff can talk to you. Uh, and and uh, I don't know all the detail. I can't remember all the details about it, but I guess this kind of goes to some of the points about not dating within it. This is any workplace, right? This happens to just be in our field, but in any workplace, things can get messy when you add your jobs working together, sorry. And then a relationship trying to work on a relationship. And then the added level for us in our field is 
we also know where you live and we have a key to come see you if we want to come see you. Um, you know, obviously can turn that uh, corner into uh, creepy and terrifying really, really quickly. So um, again, there's no perfect answer for this, but it doesn't hurt to um, listen to your gut some, to listen to your team. Uh, if they say something casually, bring them in, let them know that you can offer them some sort of confidentiality um, in at least letting them explain it because you'd rather you'd rather have that than look back and say, she's been telling me, oh, this CA has been telling me about this guy for the last three weeks, you know, before it happened. That would be gut wrenching, um, you know, as someone in management to think that someone tried to tell me something before something like this tragic happened. So how do you guys uh, handle red flags? Like in a, like in my position, I can fire pretty openly, you know what I'm saying? That's comforting. Yeah, that's comforting, right? <laughs> so when you see red flags, like I have a no tolerance to red flag type situation, but in your guys' space and been in the situation that you guys have been in and, you know, you work for a bigger operation, a bigger corporation, how do you handle red flags? And first, can they come back to you if you oversee a red flag? First and foremost, I mean, especially with, you know, a lot of these larger companies, your first move has to be to HR, you know, to your regional manager, to whomever's directly above you, but you've got to go to your HR um office because start you know, a lot of these companies, yeah, you got to start the paperwork. They have a process they'll outline for you. They have to do things a certain way. So the company's not liable. Um, mm. It's one of those things where it gets to a point as, as, as the general manager that it's almost out of your hands. It's almost at this point, once I, once I kick that first domino down and I go to HR and I say, this is what I'm seeing, they're going to open some sort of investigation. They're going to want to talk to people at that point. You're, you know, you're just kind of navigating that for them. But always want to keep an eye out for red flags and you hate to be the person that that is uh, zeroing, trying to zero in on things that may not be there just to, you know, think you see something when you don't. But you have to be very open and honest with your HR department, with your regional manager. You know, those folks have done this. This is that's why they're here for you. They're a resource for you. So, um, you know, I always we, I did have an issue with a with a, a maintenance manager at one of my properties. And um, as far as being uh, a little aggressive towards some of his coworkers and you just got to go to HR first. You can um, let them know that you've disciplined them or that you've talked to them, but you've got to let them document it so they can start the process because they're going to have a whole different process from what you have. Yeah. And I know you are probably nodding your head as you heard Chase say the freedom to be able to let people go because that's something we would love to have in this field. Um, Everyone listening right now knows how hard it is to get rid of an employee, even if they are a terrible employee, there's nothing quick to do about, you know, it's a, it's a really, really tough process. Sometimes you have to have three or four points of, of documentation, even to have them take it serious. Um, and, and sometimes even it's just kind of the larger issues that they could do or an incident still only counts as one of those documentations. And to Corey's point about going to HR first, here's what, here's what I've done before, uh, poorly, uh, I've given my three or four warnings at my site level. And then, so then I go and I take it up and I'm, I'm at wit's end and then I go take it up to HR uh, and then they want to give three or four. So we're talking, you know, someone six or seven times of some kind of blatant insubordination or, or uh, rule breaking. Meanwhile, obviously it affects the rest of your team. Everybody knows that. So um, as he says, uh, depending on how your company's set up and, and if you're a VP or, or, that, or that level, maybe think about looking at what this process looks like or what your GMs are being told because they're giving three or four chances and then they're coming on and they're getting three more, four more chances from, uh, you know, from the HR side. Um, at corporate, then again, this is a downside to the morale at site, you know, on site, this, this, this can cause a lot of issues from there. So, um, you know, uh, Gary V who does a lot of, uh, um, you know, talks about, talks about you're going to be a good hire. You got to be a good fire as well. Um, and there's a lot of red tape in there and every state has a different rule about, um, whether it's 45 days, 90 days where they can, um, you know, let people go without, having reasons per se, but I know that some of the companies have their own rules in that area. So take your time hiring. If you have a bad feeling, I also say this too. If someone can't show up to work or has a bad attitude the first few days, if they can't fake being an an ideal employee for the first two to three weeks at a job, that should tell you what you need to know as far as projection out. And sure, maybe, maybe you're wrong one in 50 times, but trying to get rid of somebody at a later process or trying to fill another position or replace somebody can be really, really tough process. And again, as this hiring process is going on right now, we're trying to find anybody, this can really be dragged out. So I would also suggest too, we, we had a lot of success um, actually talking with our comps in the city, as far as some employees, they'll travel from place to place to, you know, 
staying within the, within the business. And if I ever had any questions or, you know, I, I had some friends that were running other property, obviously we kind of all know each other, whether we're with the same company or different companies, um, you know, check with them and see if, see if there's, if they've heard of anything, if they've heard of people or, you know, it, it, it never hurts to, you know, I know we're all in competition, but at the same time, we're all doing the same thing. We're all under the same stress, seeing the same problems. Um, sometimes it's, it, it's easy to, to go to someone, you know, that may be a direct competitor, but, um, hopefully they have, you know, on a personal level, they have everyone's best interest in art as we all should, and can maybe provide some information that you didn't know was out there. And check your references for these individuals, especially when you're hiring manager level, make sure their references are good. I know sometimes, you know, you're just trying to hire so quickly, you don't have time to do it, or you call once they don't answer. Uh, but check your references. Another little trick I've done before, just to, just to verify and double check, I had somebody who put down a reference point at a place they worked at but it was like a, a lateral position there. Um, and I actually called the site and talked to them. And, and I've actually even gone up beyond that because again, if I'm going to hire someone and I know the process of letting people go is a tough one for me, I really do want to utilize and check all of my references that I have. So absolutely, I know that kind of went uh, all over the place. But that's <laughs> the whole point of this thing is we're going to have open, honest discussion. Uh, we really look forward to having you all set some of these topics for us to go over. And again, every episode, at least we're going to have our, our turn tip and we're going to obviously, uh, you know, dive into the churn process. And we really want to kind of take you all through in real time throughout this off season, you know, what our stages are when we're hunting for vendors, you know, when we're talking to our maintenance for our last quarterlies, all of these things, we're, what to do in January, February, which is kind of the, um, you know, downtime to some in the student housing room. We really want to cover all these areas, right? So uh, we want your feedback. You all give us some topics to talk about. And we're going to just kind of discuss again during this off season right now. So we appreciate y'all checking us out, Corey and myself. Uh, we thank you for checking out Prop Ops today and uh, we'll see you next episode.